I bid you a fun good day, as always. Today we leave behind, in essence, the esoteric questions, the explorations of space and time and the mysteries, and instead we pay close attention to the home front, in this case, the self. We will entitle this lesson a how-to lesson, a practical application. In this case, how to reset a self-image. Of course, you know that you have availability to many, almost an infinite number of ideas, and that you may change your mind as many times as you wish, exploring one polarity and then another. All of the ideas that you have are creative ones, those that you enact and those that you choose to forego for the moment, perhaps visiting them at a later time. And yet there is an idea that you have one life to live or that the emphasis is upon this life. One life, in essence to you, at least unconsciously, means one self or one good try at it or one self-image that you can either improve or non-improve or make certain effects or certain changes upon. But how much? How does one, in essence, change a personality or truly change a mind? Is it only through the evolutional process where a mind evolves over a great deal of lifetimes or over one life? Eventually, one comes to a point where one looks back and says, well, I have come a long way. But what if instead there were many, many intersecting moments and timelines where you could make not only changes, not only small changes, but truly exchanges, exchanging the self, the point of view, the idea of self. And this is what we wish to explore with you today. So first we must have a little bit more of an understanding of what the self is and so then what the self-image is. The self belongs to you. The self is not exactly you. In some ways the self is more than what you think it is. Most of the time you believe that you are your personality or your personality's thoughts. After all, these are the ones that accompany you on a daily and on an hourly basis. Ask to check in if I were to pause and say, hmm, and what are you thinking of just now? You would recall what you are thinking of and think that it is you that is thinking these thoughts. Since that is the first answer that you will arrive at, that is what you think you are and who you think you are. Your personality, the sum of your ideas, your preferences, the way that you dress, how you express yourself, your chronological age, the color of your hair, your relationship to others, how you occupy your days, your career, your patterns of sleep or eating, your height and weight, on and on. This is how you would describe you. Now, is that the self? In this case, I say to you, no. Although, with certain terms, you would say that is my self or your self. That being true, it is not the same as the self. The self is something that you have. It is something that you organize in a certain way. The first self that you had, or perhaps have, is the one that you arrived into this life with. The self is a gift of spirit. 
It is as if a going away gift, if you like. Here you are going on a journey. Now you will have a body in a third dimensional world, this time being the earth. Here are some nice parting gifts for you. Later on, you will look inside your bag and you will find that there is a self there. Well, the very first one that you received is a little bit like that. You may think of it, if you like, as an inflatable self. And then you will pump it up and see what you have got and how you want to personalize it. Though the self then is an organizational file of ideas that is presented to you. And you peruse these at your convenience, your soul does, even as you are a very, very, very young child, a babe, in the womb or before then or shortly after that. So it is important for the sake of this discussion that you do not merely think of yourself then as only a babe because the soul, of course, is a very ancient being. So the first self that you have then with its set of organizational ideas is how you begin to create a life. And into this organizational file, you begin to place ideas that you want to express or ideas that you would like to explore. Both of these make up the original self. And so you organize the self in such a way that you will be sure to include at least these ideas or the experience of these ideas. That will then help guide you in your process of discovery. As you begin to work or create that self, it also now becomes a self-organizing file because in essence you have imbued the self with some of your characteristics. So it will seem to you, at least in the beginning, that the personality and the self are one. Now, to further confuse things a bit, the self does have a personality and the personality does have a self-awareness about it. And that is why it can become confusing and why you think that perhaps these are both one. So the personality then are all of the ideas, true or false, matters not, that are associated with this life. You may have gathered some of these for yourself, aligning them with your purpose before your incarnation here, or some of these may have been given to you, transferred to you by your parents or by the environment that you saw around you, by the very ideas that seem true or false. Some of these including the survival ideas or mechanisms as well. All of these part of a personality, including things that you may have brought along with you from past lives or other ideas that were shared to you, karmic influences and like that. That is the personality which again can be changed and exchanged in some ways. Better put, the personality can be modified. It can be improved upon. It can be delved into. But the self, again, remember that I have said that that is something greater and grander after all. So the self then is what you are rather than who you are. The self can take on the aspects of a personality, but it will never become the personality. You can always count on the self to be present for you in its full abilities. However, you cannot always count on the personality. As you know, at times, the personality will move into retreat, for instance, during time of fear, or perhaps with embarrassment, or perhaps with any of the other human frailties. The self is not made of these frailties. The self does not truly have fears. Remember, it is an organizational system. So the self does have characteristics that emulate those of a personality, but the self will always take these to the higher degree.
That is why you have a self-image or self-awareness and how all of these can be improved upon even when the personality cannot figure its way out and how to improve itself in that way. The organizational being that is the self is always improving itself. It is a self-reflective system. You may imagine it as something that is made of a mirror-like material. It is always able to self-explore or to delve into the moment. The self is able to say, I think I can do that better next time and do that better. Because until the next moment, it will be fine-tuning all that it is made of and learning. So the self, like the self-image, is always learning about itself, about the world, about life, about others. The self is always evolving. Again, the same is not true of the personality. The personality can improve. It can learn about itself, about others, and about its world. But more often than not, the personality, after a certain degree, relies upon what it has already learned and says, well, that's that. That's what works in this life or with this body or with what I have been given to work with. Fortunately for you, you have a personality and you have a self, one that can be remade many, many times over. Eventually and over time, the personality gives way to the self. The personality begins to learn from the self as well, particularly once it reaches an adult format. And the personality will begin to draw to itself the wisdom gained by the self. If indeed it is wisdom and the personality knows and reflects upon this, the personality will return to the self, to this system, again and again and again for assistance. So the personality goes to the higher self, for instance. This is another aspect of self. The higher self is the part of you that has expanded to a greater capacity and can remain at that capacity or at that frequency. So any time that the personality deems it appropriate or is willing to, it can reach and touch the higher self and draw from it all of the wisdom that would otherwise escape its normal or average frequency. So perhaps you begin to see then that the self has many different aspects, many different chapters to explore, many different ways in which it can express itself to you and allow you to express yourself in and throughout your life as well. Now, the self then being a self-organizing system, it would seem that that would be all there is to it. There it is. It organizes itself. It is able to evolve. It is able to reach and touch consciousness. It serves and understands the personality, and it is always at work for you, and you can always change or exchange it. Why isn't that enough? Why not call it just that? Well, you can. But being that you are a human being with many choices and that you have many different ancestors to draw upon, many different dimensions that you are choosing to explore at once, many different purposes that you have lined this life with and yet hope to explore and delve into, well, all of these purposes and mysteries that you have brought with you to share and to discover, at times, they require a different self, a different kind of self. So, where there is a will, there is a way. And that is exactly how the self changes from the will. Where is the will located? The will has a place within you. You can find your will somewhere in the center of your being, somewhere beneath the heart 
and above the gut, somewhere there in your solar plexus, you will find the will. The will, like the self, belongs more to the moment. It is not exactly your will, but you have use of it. Perhaps that is why it is called will power or divine will or like that. It is not called personality's will, but the personality can become willful, see. So, the will then, the will, is the active place within you. It is the plug, it is the switch, which when activated then, allows great change to take place. It is the will that makes all of your different aspects of self active. It turns everything on or adjusts the volume of your life. It adjusts your ability to see or to see clearly or to see beyond a certain moment or till tomorrow or beyond many tomorrows. It is the will that adjusts how you live your life to what degree you are present in your life or in your body. It is the will that assists you with whether you like or dislike yourself or someone else or what you are doing or thinking. It is the will that guides the personality, but it does not overstep its boundaries. And so the will allows the personality to call the shots, if that is how you are organized. If you believe that you are the personality, the will will not argue this point with you. Remember, it is the switching station. It can elevate or expand frequencies or leave them at the lower volume or condition. A perfect example will be when there is illness present in the body. The will can very effectively move illness out and through the body very quickly. Or the will can see that there is something to be gained by the personality that for one reason or another wants to be sick or ill, whether it is to have the restive effects of the common cold for a few days or to explore something as severe as a cancer. So the will is the very aware nature of you, the switching station. It can switch thoughts from lower thoughts to higher thoughts. It can turn the personality switch down so that the self can come forward. It can assist in remaking goals and ideas. It is important for you to begin to think that what you are is a series of available choices. You are not necessarily the body that holds all things together, but you have a body. You are not necessarily all of the thoughts and ideas that guide each day, but you have these available to you and much more to explore at any time of your choosing. All that you are, then, is again a little bit more better described as an organizational system of thoughts and ideas and preferences and switches. All of these will allow you to become more of what you are. As you become more of what you are, more choices present themselves to you and you begin to see that different ideas require different choices or modes of thinking so that you cannot necessarily simply look in one direction and say, I will go there or become that. You can, but the personality does not think so. The personality does not think that you can be a blonde one day and a brunette the next day, so it does not give you that option that being a simple choice or option. And before you know it, the personality begins to dictate all that it thinks you can and can't do. And so, 
this thinking that it is you, the self becomes a quieter version of you, waiting for an opportunity for its turn, waiting for the will to turn on or off the switch to the personality so that it can engage in your favor. Most of the time, at a certain point in your life, you become aware of the self or having a self or you become aware that there are times and moments when self and personality do not agree. Perhaps you have noticed at times that there is a tennis match taking place within your left hemisphere and your right hemisphere as you attempt to consider an idea. Why? You are only one being. Why so many ideas to consider? Why are there so many what if this and what if the other? Why could you not arrive at a simple and a logical conclusion? And it is because the reason that I have given you moments earlier. What you are and who you are are a little bit different. And the way to find agreement within them is by linking the will and the self to all of the other parts of you. To give self-image, self-awareness, self-direction, self-evolution, self-discovery, a greater part to play in your life. And yet this must come from choice and you must work with the personality to allow it, in fact, to choose it. Assuming in this moment, then, that you begin to choose to discover your self-image and to improve it for some reason, why would you come to that conclusion? What could be wrong with your self-image that you would choose to improve it or even to choose a new one. Well, the self-image is always aware of everything that is taking place in all of your energy fields, in every dimension that you are participating, in every assignment that you have given yourself, in every aspect of growth in your life, and in all the ways in which you represent yourself to you, and to all of your environments. The self, the self-aware part of you, brings that awareness to you. And at certain points, at certain crossroads, where the personality is quiet and it is humble, it looks back and to the sides and forward and says, hmm, it is possible that there is another way it is possible that there is a better way. These are the moments in which you say to yourself, why have I been knocking my head against the wall, doing this or thinking that, when there is a better or a simpler way or another way? These are the moments when you allow yourself to become quietly committed to change. And these are the moments in which the self, the will, and the self-image begin to shift and change. How many such moments are there like this in life? Well, an infinite number, if you can imagine an infinite number. But at the same time, imagine how often, how much your personality thinks of what it is. And in these moments also imagine, remember how difficult it is to quiet the mind and the personality at once. More of the time it is when you find yourself in a moment or mode of suffering that you begin to quiet and listen or look for another way. While things appear to be going very well in the outer life, there is less need or necessity then for the personality to look elsewhere or to count on its own evolution. The personality sees this as losing control. It sees this as needing to work. It sees this as a series of rights and wrongs based on the polarities that it understands. And yet in the quieter moments, the self, 
receives the personality and in that way encourages it to see much more. Now remember, the personality is simply the part of you that thinks it knows that it is you. And it thinks that it thinks and it thinks that it knows. So the personality sees the self but sees it as a series of choices or switches as we have described them earlier. Most that are not necessary because it believes that it has everything under control. Of course, the self is not interested in control. It is interested in discovery. It is interested in creativity. And it is interested in will or will power. And so when these moments, when these crossroads come up, the self does become in power, in charge, and in its full glory of will power. And during these moments, that is when true change can come about in your life. So simply put, the personality is capable of making the smaller changes in life the smaller preferences, where it comes to habits, the smaller ideas. The personality is also very prone to polarities and very prone to fears, its own fears and those that are attached to it from or to others or from other lives as well. And that is one of the reasons that it is not so easy to change or to find opportune moments to change. However, the more that you, what you are, the fullness that you are, all that we have said earlier, when the full measure of your being is able to begin to deeply communicate with the personality, not in fear, but in communion, in community union of the body and all that is needed in this life, then without fear, at opportune times, the personality will surrender to the self and allow the self, in some cases self-awareness and in some cases self, higher self, self, self-discovery to begin the process of true change or evolution or true choice. And now we continue. In order to remake a self or the self-image, there must also be communion with the soul. Because remember that the soul, in some ways, pre-programmed this life. It programmed it for a life of change and opportunity and creativity with a certain set of parameters within certain boundaries, certain ideas, possibilities and purposes and such. But of course, the soul being all about evolution is very open to change, particularly true change. True change is that that once the change is made, it is to the benefit and credit of all things and all aspects of self and soul. So that is the difference between true change or for instance, partial change. True change then is permanent if it is wished to be permanent and has an almost immediate benefit upon all, the physical, the mental, the emotional, the causal, all of the decisions, all of the relationships and like that. It is change that infuses the soul and benefits even Gaia, even the earth. So that is true change it is soul-inspired and it is the soul that uses the self and the self's idea of itself. So, self-image is the soul's idea of self. And it is the self that possesses the personality. And both of these relate through soul to a life or a lifetime, life stream, what you would call it. In moments in when the personality is quiet and the soul is most active and true change is present, 
one can exchange self, self-image. It is a time in which true improvement, evolution, choice and change and creativity are all present. And so the first how-to or the first step in the process, if you were to consciously choose it, is exactly as we have said. It is to quiet the personality so that it feels a kinship, a brotherhood with all that is self, all that is choice, all that it says so, so that it is no threat. There is a common thread, but there is no common threat that would eliminate the personality or limit its extensions or choices in any way. The personality is and must see this as an extension of its own being, as its own structure, as its own creative choice. Its survivability is not threatened, and in fact, it is an enhancement to the personality itself. In this way, in partnership, personality assists the self and the self assists the personality and it is a moment in which great change can and often does take place. Again the step being self-image to connect with soul. How do you connect with soul? Again the idea of being much more than what you think that you are. You begin to eliminate boundaries. You eliminate the boundary that you are only your body. You eliminate the boundary that you are only mind, brain, thoughts. You expand and eliminate the boundary that you are defined by space and time of the third dimension. You go beyond and eliminate the boundary that it is this life and only this life that has certain parameters and purposes that limit you. You begin to unravel even time and space. And as you hang in the balance there, literally it will almost feel as you are hanging there in space, dangling by your legs or by your essence or by your spirit self, you will begin to feel that you are also sustained in the process by something great. Something is uplifting you. Something is holding you up. Something is backing you up. And that is your connection to soul. Now it does not matter in this case how connected to soul you are or whether you feel anything in the process or not whether you think about it or feel about it, see anything or not, none of this is of any consequence. It is a determinative moment. You determine that this is what you wish to do and be in this moment, and the moment rearranges itself for you on your behalf. Already, the self is at work with the switches and buttons as we have described them, organizing the self for your benefit. Now then, as the self-image and the soul are connected, the very first thing that takes place is to attend to the lower aspects of being, in this case being the body. So we are not saying the lesser aspects of being. In essence, we are simply saying the lower or more dense frequencies of being, those that make up the physical body. So the physical body then, you must ask yourself while it is being remade for you, how do you feel about the body? In cases where you are remaking self and remaking ideas, it is best to think of it as the body, just as we have said, the self-image. Because in this moment, it does not truly belong to you. Because in this moment, you are not being your personality or the part that thinks that it is you. So, the self working upon the body, you will have much more success 
in determining how and what you would like to do with this body. So it is a fine time to begin to see how you feel about your body. What does it mean to you? In this case, it is not whether or not you feel that it is the most attractive of all bodies. We are not speaking here of body image. Perhaps we will speak of that another time. In this case, it is the self-image. So, is this your body that you are studying or that you wish to change? Is it the body's image of itself that you wish to change? Or is it the personality's image of the body that you wish to change? When you are in this more open state, it will be more obvious to you than when you are in your personality state simply looking at a mirror. What does the body mean to you? How important is the body to you? Certainly you need the body in order to survive in the physical, so it has at least that importance. But if that is so, then why? Why do so many not care for their body so much, either its appearance or its health? The body is treated in many ways as if it were not so very valuable, as if it were not even expected to last for very long, although you do. So it is important to look now at the body and to see if it has dear importance to you or only relative importance to you. As you begin to determine this, the self will be able to act or respond or react in your favor. In order to make as many or most of the changes that are desirable to the self, it is helpful for the body to be regarded highly. When you regard your body highly, it responds to you with better health, better patterns of sleep and wakefulness, better digestive habits, better absorption of all that is natural and necessary to the body, better elimination habits, better and higher quality standards of creativity, even discernment, less fear, I will tell you that the body has many, many rewards to dole out, and many of these are set by the wayside based upon the personality's idea about how it feels about itself or about its body. So the very first thing that you can do to reset the self-image is to hold the body in very high regard, to see it as very necessary very important, very creative, to see its longevity as long-lasting and that it is the self that regenerates this longevity based upon the soul's code and the soul's directive, not necessarily based upon what you eat or do not eat correctly as the personality would otherwise assess. There are many that hold the body as if it were a borrowed body and not theirs at all, as if it was simply borrowed from a library. Now, of course, in some ways it is, but it is yours to customize, as you will, during the time that it is yours. And yet, there are those that simply use it a little bit like a bag of bones, as you might imagine not caring for it, and a little bit more like a rented vehicle that they will return along with the keys one day soon. So while you have an opportunity to reset the self-image of the body, it would be a fine idea to reset the code of the body, to customize it to your liking. It is your body. It belongs to this life. It can be programmed to be very receptive, very open, very communicative, very fluid body. And so you may make what choices you wish. The way to make changes and choices for the body at the level of self and self-image 
is not necessarily to say what you do not want or do not like or approve about the body. It is more to set about custom it. You make your body a choice. I choose to have wellness that is creative in each and every day. Wellness that is expressive from the inside out. So when you make a self-image, even the body's self-image, you begin from the inside out. The inner aspects of the body have a higher frequency than the outer aspects of the body. So you begin, for instance, with the chakras or the ideas of self, the centers of the body that regulate the body's evolution that eventually regulate the body's organs and functions. So you begin with a state, a condition, in a desire of longevity, of wellness, and of excellence in health. You see, that is how you will describe it because the self understands what excellence is. The self understands what perfection is and the self understands what wholeness is. By contrast, your personality does not. Your personality does not think of you as whole. It can only think of everything that is missing in hopes that someday it will be found. It does not think of beauty as perfection, and it does not think of itself as beautiful for the most part. The self, however, understands the true nature of things because the self works at the vibratory level where the personality works at the lower frequency levels simply based upon what it is made of. So self-image from the inside out is created by choice that is aligned with the soul that knows what the entire self is. Between self and soul, there is the ability to reset the codes to a more perfect understanding of self, to a frequency and a vibratory level that are self-expression, self-determinant, meaning that they can continue to adjust themselves beyond this moment with your permission. And so the body begins to remake itself when left under the condition, under the control, if you like, of self and soul. Consider that your body's relationship to wellness and toxicity and consciousness and all, in fact, including how grounded it is, all of this is relative to the self and the image and idea of self. Again, working from the inside out, the self can begin to navigate the false ideas left by the personality, a little bit like trash that has not been picked up in some time, and the self can begin to clean up some of these operations where the personality would simply say, we'll get to it, or perhaps it would say, it's too late for that already. It's already firmly in place, or it's too late to change that about me, or about what I am, or about what life is like. One of the largest differences between personality and self is that the personality will give up on you, give up on an idea, it is overdue, it is over time, it is too late, it is not worth it, it is too much work, it is too much trouble. The self does not do this. The self does not abandon you, nor an idea. The self does not say, well, I guess it wasn't supposed to be. The self sets about making the being and the moment what is most opportune, what is most delightful, what is most creative. At the earliest hour, at the latest hour, the self does not measure itself by chronological age. The self 
does not measure itself by relative successes or failures or how many attempts have been made in a certain direction in a certain life. The self is the most active and creative aspect of what you are, an infinite resource for you to draw upon infinitely, and yet it is most active when the personality that often sets up its roadblocks and boundaries would prevent this from happening. So with the personality's permission, the self continues to set aside making changes and continues to move in these directions. In order to move into the next layer of self beyond the body, the self must also then interact with mind and with mind's thoughts. The self is also not the mind and not the thoughts, not the thoughts about the body, not the thoughts about the life. The self then interacts with mind at the level of self-awareness. So in this case, mind yields to awareness in the same way that personality yields to self. To yield does not mean to give up. It does not mean to surrender. It does not even mean to move into the background. To yield means only to allow that which has a greater force, greater love, greater compassion, or a greater ability to see a moment all of the way through to the completion of something. So when you yield to the self. It is in order to allow the self to determine what is best in the next moment and to set a paradigm of thoughts for the besting of life. The mind then does this through awareness. As you know, you have already within you a desire for greater awareness. Although you do not always define this in certain ways, the desire is present nonetheless. As you choose self-awareness, the mind becomes quieter just a little bit because the mind then works in compassionate companionship with the self and with self-awareness. The mind wants to become more aware of itself. It wants to become more aware of life and of its environment. It knows this. It chooses this. And here it is simply a matter of finding a moment that is more creative and more workable than most. In your busy work-a-day world, when your personality is most online, you will find that it is most difficult to have mind yield to self-awareness. However, in this case, I will give to you the example and the suggestion that you take yourself into any aspect of nature that you can give to yourself. A backyard, if there is no better, a walk in the woods, if it allows itself, a moment at the beach, a mountain top, a moment of seclusion, if nothing else presents itself, and where you can give yourself at least an interaction with one or more of the elements of the earth, your mind would truly appreciate this because it is guided very much by the elements. So where you can give yourself a candle or a flame, where you can give yourself a small amount of water, a streamlet, even a running faucet would do. Where you can give yourself a breath of fresh air, where you will allow yourself to be deep and with the earth or with the sands or with the stones. Any of this will allow the mind to yield because the mind then becomes aware of being with the elements themselves and the mind's awareness will tune to that frequency, an earth frequency if you like. And the very next thing 
awareness of this frequency will take over and begin to reinstate newer thoughts or thoughts that you have contemplated for some time and thought that you could return to or ideas that you had abandoned about yourself or about this life or about certain projects that you did not think that you could bring to fruition, all of this comes about because mind and thoughts yield to self and self-awareness as conditioned, as brought about by permission and interest of the soul. And again, change and choice begin to happen within first. Everything that you do comes from the inside out. All of the choices and changes that you will make will be inspired from within and from the inside out you remake the self-image. The self-image can change many, many times. It can evolve. It can remake itself, its ideas about itself almost as often as you wish with awareness and with assistance. The self-image, then, is also guided and influenced by the emotional ideas or the emotional ideas of the thoughts. So you have an emotional body. Like the physical body, it has certain functions, certain operations that it performs many of the times in your favor sometimes seemingly against you, as if a self-inflicted wound. So the emotional body, easily injured, is very near the surface of your being. The personality purposely pushes it there. Sometimes it gives it a shield to protect it, and sometimes, as you know, it throws it to the wolves to see what it will do, or if it can sink or swim. The personality uses this emotional body as its own self-defense. It uses the emotional body to show you why you need the personality, why you must guard your emotions, protect your ideas, or not show your true self in the world. And so the personality offers up the emotional body as the sacrificial lamb at times. And then when it returns injured from battle as it would, then it takes it in, patches it back up and says, see, that's why it's not a good idea to go there or do that or say that. So the emotional body, then, is also in need of repair. The emotional body suffers perhaps more injuries than any other aspect of your being. It is interesting that I see humanity wear its variety of helmets and caps to protect its brain well. Perhaps you had better use a helmet to protect your emotional body as that would be almost more appropriate. However, help is on the cue. And the way to that is to turn the emotional body over to the self. Because the personality is a little bit like a negligent or abusive parent. It does not truly see that the emotional body is a child, a creative child with ideas that are worth nurturing and that yes it requires protection but not from the outer world or the inner world. More than anything it requires to be protected from the personality itself. So the emotional body then in this quiet moment can make an appeal to the self. And the self, along with the soul, can take the emotional body, damaged or whole or in what condition it arrives, and begin to align it with self, with purpose, 
with true ideas, with true healing, with emotive thoughts. Emotive thoughts are a little bit like a healing balm for the emotional body. Emotive thoughts are those that attach themselves, in essence, to negative thoughts and ideas about self or life, catch them a little bit like one at a time in a loop or a chain, and then, little by little, gently eliminate them from the body, the mind, from all of the different layers of being, and from the life itself. So these emotive aspects of self then are very, very important. At first they will feel very, very vulnerable to you, as if you are out on a limb or out without a net beneath you from a very high precipice. But soon you will see that nothing happens and that these emotive aspects, in essence they are baskets that are gathering tears, misunderstandings, misjoinings of thoughts that never were meant to be or become fears. And as all of these begin to gather together, the emotive aspects of self will begin to allow the elimination process to move these out of your field placing them in a temporary stasis for a time until they can be eliminated a little at a time without any cost or without leaving you barren or bereft of emotion. Allowing it to move this way leaves the emotional body for the most part intact because the self-image has the ability to use the emotive influences or the true emotions of self to bring about the most positive and the most gentle results. The results being that self-image begins to feel more clear, more open, more available, more present. You will begin to feel as if you are filling out your life a little bit more. As if the life in which you have been living in only one room of, now you recognize that you can move into all of the different places in your home or in your life. That you do not need to live in a little corner of your life because there are fears or the excesses of the emotional body everywhere else. It is no longer a daunting task because the self then begins to work clearly, cleanly, plainly to eliminate those things that have troubled you, cost you, pained you or abandoned you. So in these moments you can trust the self and all of its emotive influences to bring about the most endearing results. The next aspect to look at is the self-image of the spirit that transmits through you. All that we have done thus far is with the potent power of soul. But now there is spirit as well. And like the element of air, it is to be found everywhere in every aspect of your life, placing and replacing all things. It is spirit that is part of the breath. Certainly you draw oxygen, but what else do you draw into the body? What else fills every cavity of your being? How do you oxygenate your thoughts and your ideas? How is it that you rest at night and wake in the body? So it is the spirit that courses through everything that you are and everything that you do. And the self recognizes this. Remember that the personality still thinks that it is running the show. But the personality does not truly understand what spirit is. So it acknowledges that it is present, but not very much 
or very often. In this moment of self-awareness, self-discovery or resetting the self-image, the spirit becomes very, very important. So the spirit is a gift from the soul. The spirit is the soul saying to you, Here, I give this to you as a gift that you will have in every moment to remember that you are soul first, life first, and everything else second. That is why it is the spirit that is represented by the breath. So in every moment's breath, you are present, you are alive, you are soul. So to reset the self-image using the spirit, you will enter it or use it via the breath. It is the breath that you align with slowly and gently. And as if you were threading some very beautiful string of pearls, with each inhalation, you will thread one pearl of spirit, one perfect sphere, opalescent, beautifully created by nature itself, a gift of all the kingdoms, the pearl of knowledge, the pearl of wisdom, the pearl of well-being, the pearl of creativity, the pearl of discovery, the pearl of consciousness, the pearl of an unfettered life. With every inhalation you will draw one pearl onto a very golden thread. With every exhalation you will allow anything that is less than an opalescent pearl to very easily, like a fine oil, slide off of that same golden thread. Nothing to discard Nothing ugly to visualize or dirty. It simply slides right off that golden thread, right through or in between the pearls. It is just a small amount of oil. And with every inhalation, the pearls continue to thread themselves right onto the golden thread. And when you have thought of every possibility that you would like to add to your golden thread, your string of pearls, eventually you will have one or two breaths that feel as if they are the completing ones or the clasp, if you like, to the neck lace that you have just made. And so the spirit weaves itself through every thought, through every idea, through every discovery of self. It begins to remake what you are, the idea of self. The self ideas that self motivate you. You will find that spirit moves you, spirit motivates you. It creates a sense of aliveness, of wellness. So you draw to yourself the self-image of spirit. And as you do so, you will see that it will also begin to assist you in remaking any ideas or lesser truths that you have had about self and life and what you are capable of or what you were limited by. It is very, very open and available to you. Now we are nearing the completion of this self-guided tour of self-awareness, but there are yet one or two more points to consider. Consider that your self-image also has a relationship to the earth. Your self-image has a relationship to all other aspects of self upon the earth. So your 
image of self, your ideas of what the self are, if you will allow them to expansively create themselves, you will also find that you have many new ideas of what others' self looks like. And you may begin to create a different relationship for yourself and for the self as it relates to others. All too often you have become accustomed to relating to everyone else's personality as if that is who they were. Well, they are much more than that as well, just as you are. So as you find yourself once again enlivened and perhaps enlightened a bit by your self and self-image, as you begin to greet others, begin to look beyond the personality that presents itself and to see a greater being, a greater image, a greater self there dancing in the background, hoping to be claimed or acknowledged just as you have done now in this moment. As you do this, you will find that the self becomes even more self-assured. And as it is assured of itself, of its progress, of its abilities, of its will, and of its freedom, it will begin to lead you, rather than having the personality lead you by the nose as it is prone to do, you will see that your self-image rises. From the ground up, from the inside out, you will begin to find yourself lighter and more uplifted by spirit's image of itself and you, of all of the different aspects of you, and you will begin to move toward an idea of wholeness, of perfection, beyond any idea that the personality might fathom. The personality's idea of wholeness is almost an unbalanced one because it is unfathomable. Why? Because it will never allow you to reach that place. It will slow you, steer you in another direction, blindfold you. It will not allow you because it does not believe that it is perfect or whole or beautiful. But the self does. The self knows, the self is, the self is assured of this. And as you begin to be assured of what you are and how to go about a greater truth and a greater life, you will make a move toward wholeness, perfection, and you will stay in a protected state regarding this. This is something that is notable about self-image and self-awareness. It will protect the changes that it has made. It will protect the enhancements that it has drawn to it. And in all ways, it will allow you to be and to become more of what you are, to recognize it, to realize it, to draw upon it, to create with it, to call the will forward more often, to direct and to design your life in accordance with the soul and with its every idea that the soul is, can make and remake itself in its own image, which is that of light, perfection and beauty. So I have offered to you an exercise, one that brings about perfect awareness an improvement of self-image and self-directional thoughts, one that will move you from within to without and without back within again in more balanced proportion, whether it be in body, in thought, in feeling, or in action. It will reconnect you more dearly and more closely to soul and spirit, to your own and to that of others, loved ones, adversaries, friends. In all ways, sweet ones, I have brought benefit to you. 
Now I have given you a tool to work with. It is one that we will revisit another day as we compare and look into other subjects of interest to you and to the earth. Until that moment, accept the love, the compassion and the dearness that I hold for each of you. I offer to you all that I am and my resources to accompany you now and always. I bid you good day.